Top 4 Real Alien Abduction Cases to Make You Believe Alien abduction stories might be rare, but they are more common than you may think. There are strange stories of abductions reported all around the world, and the cases on this list are some of the strangest. These are the top four real alien abduction cases to make you believe. Number four, Stanford abduction. Considered as one of the most compelling UFO abduction cases ever recorded, the Stanford abduction remains a baffling mystery to UFO experts and observers alike. It happened on January 6, 1976. It was Mona Stafford's 36th birthday, so she and her two friends, Louise and Elaine, decided to celebrate by heading to Redwood Restaurant in Lancaster, Kentucky, 35 miles from their hometown in Liberty. After finishing dinner, the three of them then headed back home in what they expected to be a peaceful drive. They left the restaurant at around 11.15 p.m. with Louise behind the wheel of her 1967 Chevy Nova. The women said they didn't drink any alcohol that night and simply enjoyed dinner. Once they got on Highway 78, the women saw a bright red object above them in the clear night sky. Initially, Mona thought it was an airplane on fire and that it was going to crash soon. But moments later, Louise said the car started going faster by itself, moving at 85 miles per hour, a speed she had never done before. She cried out but couldn't control the vehicle. Mona tried to help with the steering but couldn't control it either. It just kept running at 85 miles per hour, as if pulled by some mysterious force. The unknown object followed their vehicle for some time and at some point got close to the driver's side of the car. It was here they could clearly see it was a disc-shaped craft with a dome on top. It had rows of red lights around the middle portion and yellow blinking lights on the belly. It stayed with the vehicle for a while before them moving ahead of it. The next thing the woman felt was a bluish white light shooting through and filling the interior of the car. Luis described it as being enveloped in a haze-like air, like a fog. All three women suffered minor burns and irritation from the blasted light. They then found themselves backed up into a pasture entrance flanked by stone walls and not moving. For all of them, the next memory was being back on the road inside the Chevy, still driving back to Liberty. They were shaken and frightened, but weren't sure what exactly happened or if anything actually happened at all. However, when they entered Louise Smith's home, they noticed the clock read that it was 1.20 a.m. What was supposed to be at tops a 45-minute drive had turned into two hours instead. Unsure of what was going on, they went to a neighbor's house to double-check the time and sure enough, it was 1.20. Disturbed by the time loss, the ladies phoned police but couldn't get them to help. After that, they called the Navy station, telling them what they had experienced. Both agencies didn't offer help, but the latter did report the encounter to the media, which led to the incident receiving headline status. Soon after, UFO investigators began looking into the women and their report. During the first interviews, it was clear that they were visibly affected. All three began chain smoking and were insatiably thirsty. They had minor burns which were determined to have been caused by exposure to intense radiation. Louise had a small pinkish-gray blotch at the nape of her neck, and strangely, her parakeet began showing fear and distress when around her. Instead of the bird's usual happy greeting, every time she came close, the bird would throw her wings up in fear and aggression. The bird was fine with other people, but not with Louise. Various electrical devices also began breaking down around the women. Luis's wristwatch, alarm clock, and car broke down as well. Moreover, the emotional turmoil as they searched for answers with their lost time became aggravating. It wasn't until they were placed under regressive hypnosis that they were able to recall some of the events that occurred that night. Although it wasn't a straight description, the women recalled being examined and probed. Mrs. Smith said that she was placed on a table and examined using various instruments. Mrs. Thomas said she was in a capsule-like device. She had a noose around her neck which restrained her from speaking, while Mrs. Stafford was placed in a chair-like device. These stories might seem unbelievable, but other witnesses, independent of the three women, had seen a reddish-orange dish-shaped object at 11.30 p.m. on the night of the incident as well. Meanwhile, two teenagers saw a similar low-flying UFO and tried to chase it for some time, 
even reporting that incident to the police. A farmer also said he saw an object shooting a white beam of light close to his farm around the area where the women were taken. There are no clear answers as to what it was exactly. It's a strange case that even today continues to remain a mystery. Number 3. Elizabeth Clarer When you think of alien abduction stories, the first thing people check is the reputation of the abductee. And in the case of Elizabeth Clarer, she was nowhere near ordinary. Born in 1910 in Moy River, South Africa, she grew up fascinated with Zulu legends and stories at a young age. These unique tales of Zulu sky gods were told to her by their Zulu leader named Ladam. By the time she was seven years old, Clara recalled seeing a UFO with her nine-year-old sister. They saw a pockmarked meteor hurtling towards their farm when suddenly a metallic, disc-shaped object swooped in to intercept it. She also had another encounter just a few months after. Eventually, Clara moved to Italy and studied art and music. She then went to study at Cambridge University where she took up meteorology. By 1932, she went back to South Africa and married an RAF pilot and eventually she even learned to pilot small planes herself. One day while she was flying with her husband, a large saucer came down along the same level as their plane. Elizabeth informed her husband, and as a trained military pilot, his first instinct was to launch into an evasive maneuver. Despite this though, the object kept up with them with ease before eventually disappearing. For a while, she and her husband moved to England as she was deployed at the De Havilland Experimental Station. There, she was employed as a meteorologist and became trained at watching for aerial anomalies. By the time World War II broke out, she served as a decoder for the RAF and conducted research on Foo Fighters, which were UFOs reported by many pilots during the time. She moved back to South Africa in 1943 and continued serving in the Air Force Intelligence. She divorced Stafford and remarried, this time to a man named Paul, but that marriage also ended. In 1954, she vacationed back at her farm in Drakensburg, which was now handled by her sister May. She was standing on what was later known as Flying Saucer Hill when she again witnessed a silver saucer. This time, the ship began descending lower until it was just a meter above her. She described it as a massive ellipse shape that echoed with a reverberating hum. It had a rounded dome with dotted portholes. From those portholes, she said she could see a man standing with his arms folded. According to her, he was the most beautiful man she had ever seen, and that he had a gorgeous stalk of white hair. The ship took off after several minutes. It would return 18 months later, but this time around it landed on the hill when Clara got there and the mysterious man was already waiting for her. He introduced himself as Akon, and Clara fell in love with him right away. This man had light gray eyes, golden fair skin, and aquiline features. He had straight white hair that came down to his neck, and he explained he was from the planet Meton from the Alpha Centauri system. He elaborated that they rarely mated with human beings, but when they did, they kept the offspring to help strengthen their species. According to Clara, she was impregnated by Akon and taken to planet Meton. While she was gone for four months on Earth's time, it was the equivalent to nine years on the alien planet. She described this place as having domed houses with gorgeous birds, gardens, and horses. There was also an absence of violence, alcohol, and cigarettes. She eventually gave birth and called the child ailing. However, eventually her heart couldn't adjust to the unique frequencies of the planet and she was forced to return to Earth. Her story was released to the public and she began publicly speaking about her encounter and love affair with Akon. She published her story in a book called Beyond the Light Barrier in 1980. Although some family members did back her up on the claim, there was of course no strict evidence or documentation of her pregnancy. Whether it's real or not, we may never know. However, Elizabeth maintained that her story was true until she died in 1994. Number 2. Pascagoula Abduction It was October 11, 1973 and co-workers, 42-year-old Charles Hickson and 19-year-old Calvin Parker went fishing from an old pier by the Pascagoula River in Mississippi. 
Hickson had been friends with Parker's father for a long time, and the young teen recently moved to the coast as a welder and was renting a room from Hickson and his wife. On that day after work, they headed to Hickson's place to pick up fishing equipment. By 6 p.m., they arrived at the pier and began fishing. After about an hour, sometime between 7 and 8 p.m., Parker was tired and wanted to leave, but that's when it happened. They heard a loud whizzing sound and then sighted an unusual set of flashing blue lights that Parker thought was the cops. He thought they would arrest them for fishing or at least ask them to leave. However, instead of cops, the bright flashing object turned out to be a large oval-shaped aircraft they described as being eight feet tall. A door slid open and the light blinded the two men. Hickson, who was the main person recounting the tale, said three gray and wrinkly creatures floated about two feet from the ground and headed towards them. Two of the creatures held Hickson while one grabbed Parker's arm. The men felt paralyzed and couldn't move anything except for their eyes. They were carried off inside the craft and then physically examined. By this time, Parker had fainted, so it was Hickson that narrated his experiences on what happened while inside the craft. He felt he was levitating inside a room while tests were being conducted on his body. Although it was not explicitly stated what happened, this UFO abduction is where stories of probes first started. Hickson estimates they might have been inside the craft for about 20 minutes and afterwards, he was led out of the room and reunited with Parker. At this time, Parker was conscious and was crying and praying. The creatures then returned Hickson and Parker outside, the craft doors closed and the object took off. Soon after the incident, Hickson wanted to tell their story to others while Parker was completely hesitant. They first contacted the Air Force Base Kislar, which was nearby, but they were skeptical and told them to report it to the local sheriff, which they did. Of course, officers thought it was a hoax, so the two men were placed inside a wired interview room where the sheriff observed them, thinking he would capture the men talking and laughing at the sheriff's expense. But instead of laughing, the men looked terrified and fearful while speaking about the events that evening. Somewhat believing their story, the sheriff documented their case and heard them out. They were also given a polygraph and both passed. It was primarily Hickson who went on the interviews and shows while Parker avoided the limelight, preferring to move on with his life. But out of the two, it was Parker who seemed most affected with the encounter overall. In later interviews, he said that during the abduction, he felt as if he had been given drugs. There was also a visible puncture mark seen on his left arm right after the incident. Parker seemed terrified of the beings, always thinking they might come back to get him. Soon after he was done with the interviews and investigation, Parker threw away his clothes and bathed himself in bleach water before heading back to Jones County in his home. The Pascagoula River incident became a sensation. Charles Hickson happily gave interviews, did lectures, and more. He also claimed additional encounters with the aliens in 1974. Despite ridicule and later skepticism, he never reneged on his story of abduction. Even though it wasn't initially reported, the sheriff actually gathered several eyewitness accounts of an unusual craft seen around the area during the time the abduction occurred. However, these were not included in the original police report. Number 1. Whitley Stryber Known for his horror novels, Whitley Stryber surprised people when he released his book, Communion, recounting his experiences with non-human entities. On December 26, 1985, Stryber was at his upstate New York cabin. By this time, he was already an established writer and was staying at the isolated cabin with his wife and son. He was always weary of intruders and had installed a high-tech alarm system there to keep everyone safe. One evening at around 11 p.m., he awoke to a noise and felt that someone or something had breached the cabin. He was shocked to see a creature was rushing towards him inside his bedroom and this would be his last memory for the night. He then found himself sitting in the woods alone the following day. All the memories he had of what had occurred were in bits and pieces, so he had to undergo regressive hypnosis to regain most of what happened. During the sessions, he recalled being floated out of the bedroom and whisked inside a UFO. There he encountered four distinct creatures. The first he described as a small robotic type of being, the second was a short yet stocky type of creature 
while the third was tall and slender. It also looked quite weak. The last creature hid in the background and had button black eyes. While inside the craft, he was subjected to various types of medical experiments and testing. He said the creatures made an incision in his finger and also inserted needles into his brain and probed him. Because of the unusual facts, he recalled, Dr. Donald Klein, the one who conducted the hypnosis, diagnosed Stryber with temporal lobe epilepsy. However, Stryber refused the diagnosis and believed the abduction really happened. Although Stryber does believe the events occurred, he goes to lengths and even expresses frustration that the story he has shared was termed as an alien contact when he doesn't even know what they were. In fact, he believes it's possible he may have been experimented on or his brain messed with by some sort of military agency. He is also requested later on to have extensive tests done for his supported temporal lobe epilepsy. However, all tests have found his brain to be working just fine. Since releasing Communion, he has also released other books detailing his experience further. Although these were supposedly non-fiction works, most have been labeled fiction by major publishers and shops. Whitley Stryber still continues to remain a prominent novel writer and goes on speaking engagements about his experience with the non-human entities. So there were the top four real alien abduction cases to make you believe. Alien abductions are unusual enough, but when survivors go out of their way to tell their story, the details they share can be truly terrifying. It makes you stop and think that if in fact there are aliens out there, then what do they really want from us? We have new videos coming out every Wednesday and Saturday, so please remember to subscribe to our channel because you won't want to miss out on what's coming next. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.